Selamat sejahtera and a very good afternoon to all present. Welcome to our Taylor School of Medicine webinar series entitled A Webinar on COVID-19 Vaccine. My name is Robert So Jr. and I will be your MC for today. I hope you are all excited for today. We have an esteemed panel of speakers to share their thoughts and knowledge regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. Before we begin, let me just lay down some ground rules to ensure that this webinar goes smooth and pleasant for everyone. Firstly, we will be muting and disabling videos for everyone to minimize distractions. Secondly, at any point throughout any of the speaker's presentations, should you have any questions, kindly submit your questions via the Q&A box below. Questions will be addressed during the Q&A portion at the end of each speaker's presentation. Next, throughout the webinar, there will be a few interactive sessions in which we would like all participants to join, so kindly listen for and follow our instructions. As for medical doctors who wish to collect the CPD points, the QR code, code will be provided at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned. Last but not least, this webinar is currently being recorded and streamed live on our YouTube account, so you can share the video across all social media platforms to further spread today's messages to your friends, family, colleague, and loved ones. Now, as we begin, I, first and foremost, on behalf of the organizing committee, would like to extend a warm welcome to all distinguished speakers and participants to this virtual international webinar. It is also with utmost pride to announce that this webinar is in conjunction with the 10th year anniversary of Taylor's University School of Medicine. So in a very special way, happy birthday School of Medicine. This will be our program for today. And now I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Rusli Bin Nordin, the Head of School of Medicine, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, Taylor's University, Malaysia, to give his welcome address. Over to you, Prof. Rusli. Thank you very much, uh, MC Robert. And uh, Assalamualaikum and very good afternoon to everyone uh, for making uh, time for this uh, webinar. And welcome to all distinguished speakers and participants to this highly anticipated webinar organized by the School of Medicine, Faculty of Health Medical Science, Taylor's University. This webinar represents a series of webinars organized by the School of Medicine in celebration of its 10th anniversary, 2010-2020, and reflects the commitment and dedication of its members to share the latest updates on issues of national and international concern. I would like to thank all members of the organizing committee and also our fantastic students from the Taylor's University Medical Society for their commitment and dedication. I would also like to thank the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Medical Science, Professor P.T. Thomas, for his continuing strong support for our school. Last but not least, to all our distinguished speakers for the support and commitment to take their precious time today to share their expertise in COVID-19. I also like to thank Professor Alan Koo, our adjunct professor, for moderating the session. Our three distinguished speakers, Professor Dato Dr. Musa Mohamad Nordin, consultant, pediatrician, and neonatologist, KPJ Damansara Specialist Hospital. Professor Dato Dr. Christopher Lee, adjunct professor of Taylor University, and also an infectious disease specialist and president of the Malaysian AIDS Council. And also we have our professor, Dr. Chong Pei Pei, the head of research, the Faculty of Health Medical Science, Taylor University. With that, welcome everyone. And I hope that this webinar will be truly an exciting journey for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you for that warm and welcoming address, Prof. Lee. Next, I would like to call upon Emeritus Professor Dr. B.D. Thomas, Executive Dean of Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, Taylor's University, Malaysia, to give his opening remarks. Over to you, Prof. Thomas. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished speakers, Dato Dato, uh, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words at this uh, very 
important and timely uh, webinar. Uh, it was in uh, end of December 2019 that we started hearing about a new virus in, in Wuhan. And then in early January, it became uh, better known because it had spread. And in Malaysia, we had our first cases detected in February. After our first MCO, we had a relatively small number of mortalities, 129. But today we have a total of almost 321,000 cases and 1,203 deaths, which is about 0.37% mortality. Compared to some other countries like the US, this is not too bad. But compared to others like Singapore, we could have done better. Uh, so the, it, it can be a factor uh, of reporting the number of tests that is done. And some may argue about these things. Uh, we have some vaccines already conditionally approved. We have others in the pipeline. The government has already committed to purchasing five different types of vaccines. And there are probably others in the pipeline and also through the WHO uh, collaboration of COVAX. I'm sure the speakers will cover all this, so I'm not going to, 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 to give you the details of all this. Uh, I think we are very fortunate that after the last webinar that we had about uh, 10 months ago, it is very timely that we have uh, the same one. Uh, in that first webinar, we had uh, uh, Prof. Dato uh, Christopher Lee and Prof. Chong Pei Pei to speak. And today, in addition to them, we have uh, uh, Prof. Dato uh, Musa Nordin. Uh, these are all speakers who don't need much introduction. Prof. Uh, Dato Christopher Lee is the uh, one of the foremost infectious disease specialists in Malaysia and in the region. Prof. Dato uh, Musa Nordin, a pediatrician, and uh, <clears throat> recently a very frequent speaker at uh, webinars and forum on the TV, and also in uh, uh, letters and articles in the newspaper. And Prof. Chong Pei Pei, a researcher who actually has uh, conducted research on samples uh, obtained from Hospital Sungai Bulo. So I can't think of a better lineup of speakers for this afternoon's program. It is almost like a dream team. And I think it is going to be a feast of information for all of us. And uh, we look forward to a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you for your opening remarks, Prof Thomas. It is now time for the presentation portion of our webinar. And for that, we have a very special moderator to introduce each speaker, as well as moderate the Q&A portion after each speaker's presentation. At this point in time, I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Alan Koo, Adjunct Professor, School of Medicine, Taylor's University, Malaysia. Over to you, Prof. Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Um, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this webinar on uh, COVID-19. Um, on about a, a year ago, on the 11th of March, 2020, the World Health Organization um, declared the COVID-19 as a pandemic. So we just celebrated the one, one year anniversary of that pandemic, actually. And over the past year, we had experienced an unprecedented uh, disruption of our lives uh, due to this uh, pandemic, and which is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a novel virus causing uh, affecting over 100 million people and causing the lives of more than 2 million. Um, we have also witnessed an unprecedented effort and cooperation by the research and development community in the world um, uh, to generate new knowledge from the scratch from this previously unknown disease, um, as well as to develop new ways to diagnose, treat and prevent this disease at a pace that has never happened before in the history of humanity. Um, one of the fruits of research in the world on the COVID is the COVID-19 vaccine, which is seen as a game changer in our effort 
to combat this uh, pandemic. We have heard of reports of vaccine rollouts in several countries and promising effects it has on the outbreak. And in Malaysia, the vaccines have begun to be administered and registration for the public uh, for the vaccine has started. Um, with such flurry of evolving new knowledge about uh, and information, um, it could be confusing to people. And to add to this confusion, there's also fake news appearing in social media. And to address this, we hope that what you hear, what you hear, um, you hear what is known uh, and what is true about the vaccines. And we hope that information provided will help to combat the existing disinformation and uh, unnecessary concerns. We understand that there's a wide variety of audience today, uh, from medical health personnel, students, researchers, and public. So we try to cater for a wide range of people. Um, please take note that this talk is not considered as providing specific personal medical advice to you. Yeah? Um, so I'm happy to uh, have three speakers today. Um, as mentioned uh, just now, Prof. Rosli, uh, Prof. Rosli as uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Uh, Musa, will be giving an overview of the uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Professor Christopher Lee, who will be talking about the clinical perspective of the vaccines and why we have, um, um, there are some certain groups of people who have been prioritized to receive the vaccine earlier. And uh, Professor Dr. Chong Pei Pei, who will be uh, talking about uh, the research. Yeah? So we have 20 minutes for each, with, including Q&A. Um, and that uh, for those of you who have questions, please type in the Q&A session, uh, which is in the Zoom uh, webinar app. Huh? So those who are in outside app, please, you need to actually register the Zoom and use the Zoom for, the, uh, for this. Yeah? And due to time limitations, we might not be able to answer all questions. Uh, so the panel may have to select some questions to be answered. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce to you the first speaker, uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Musa Mohamad Nodin who is the consultant pediatrician neonatologist, KPJ Damansara Specialist Center. He is a fellow of the College of Physicians of Edinburgh, the uh, Royal College of uh, Pediatrics and Child Health and Academy of Medicine Malaysia. Uh, since 1999, he had served on several international advisory boards uh, related to vaccines and immunization. And he's also the clinical professor of pediatrics at the KPJ International University College. Yeah? Uh, so over to you, uh, Dr. Musa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alan Koo. Can you see my slide? Thank you very much. Okay, um, this is uh, my brief for this, um, uh, this uh, afternoon. Right, look at the COVID vaccine trials, and then very quickly look at safety issues, and then look at the effectiveness or rather the efficacy of the vaccines that is available. And then look at the rollout program in Malaysia. If there's time, I will discuss the misinformation that is prevalent in our society and then conclude. Now, the vaccine has the benefit of, um, of um, experience with SARS-CoV-1 in 2003 and MERS-CoV-2 in 2013, right? This year is where the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 attaches itself to the, um, to the uh, tissue. And then when it enters, it causes the injury to your cells. So the antibody basically blocks this receptor binding domain. All right, so this is the major antigenic site, i.e. the spike protein, yeah? And by blocking that receptor site, it prevents the spike protein or the SARS-CoV-2 from entering and damaging the cells. And these vaccines have gone to trials, preclinical in animals, and then in phase one to ensure safety and that it is efficacious. So we're talking about 100 subjects in phase one, and in phase two, uh, in about a few hundred subjects to ensure that it is effective and the safety issues are uh, protected. And many of them have gone into phase three. And here we are talking about thousands and thousands of uh, volunteers. And now we've got the, some of the vaccines in phase four, i.e. post licensure and they undergo a process called pharmacovigilance to ensure that there are no 
uh, rare adverse effects following immunization and that they confer uh, immunity to the, to the population. This summarizes the, the vaccines that are in trials, 42 in phase one, 13 in phase two, and three in phase three. Six have been approved for, for full use, while another six have been approved for limited and early use, and four vaccines have been abandoned. Now, very quickly, to look at the four platforms of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, this is the inactivated virus. This is the conventional uh, antigen, and you find this in Sinopharm and Sinovac, the, um, the Chinese vaccines. The viral vectors you, utilizing adeno, adenoviruses, this is what you get in AstraZeneca, in, the Rush, in Russia's uh, Sputnik V, and then uh, in JNG vaccines. The nu nucleic acid, this is the cutting edge technology. This is where uh, you get messenger RNA and you have um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines here. And then protein base actually using the spike protein as an antigen, and this is uh, the uh, Novavax and the Chinese vaccine can Sinobio. Safety. I think it's very important that for us to realize that in life, we have to weigh between risks and benefits. And I'm going to do exactly that with, uh, with the vaccine. And this is the regulatory body in the United Kingdom, the uh, MHRA, the equivalent of the NPRA in Malaysia, yeah? Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. And this is their summary, right? That the COVID-19 vaccines are safe, reassuring. Most of the adverse effects are mild. They are very similar to the other vaccines that we find in, in childhood that we use in, in, uh, at the present moment in time. Okay, and that the benefits far outweigh the risks. Okay, now look at this. I'm afraid I have to use American data because the Ministry of Health is not forthcoming in sharing data with us, with the scientific fraternity, which is absolutely disappointing. Um, look at the American. The risk of an American dying from COVID-19 is one in 780. One of the most devastating adverse effect of the, of, the, of the mRNA vaccine is anaphylaxis, i.e. the patient immediately within half an hour of getting the vaccine, he faints and you may have to resuscitate him with intravenous adrenaline. Uh, yeah, so that's one in 780. But the risk of a anaphylaxis with the Moderna vaccine is one in 400,000. Now you calculate what is the risk of dying from COVID with the risk of actually getting a side effect? The risk of you dying is 500 times, okay? Secondly, what is the risk of you suffering from peanut allergy compared to you getting an anaphylaxis with a mRNA vaccine? Peanut allergy is one in 300 which is 12,000 times, and we have not stopped eating peanuts. So this, I hope, gives you some perspective of risk benefit. Another, an, another aspect of, uh, of safety, this is the risk of an American acquiring COVID and being hospitalized or dying. Now, all these are per 100,000, right? This is statistics 101. This is epidemiology 101, which is very upsetting because every time the Minister of Health stands at five o'clock in the morning, they only give absolute numbers, which is meaningless. You cannot make sensible comparison between the different states, between us and Singapore, between us and the rest of Malaysia. I am suspecting that the large number of our crowd is in this category, i.e. 20 to 29 years old. So for an American at this age, the risk of you being hospitalized is 1,000 per 100,000 patients. The risk of you dying is 30 per 100,000. Compare that with me at 60 years old, the risk of me dying with COVID is 2,000 per 100,000, right? Now, 
As I said, let us look at the risk of the vaccines. Anaphylaxis is 0 0.1 per 100,000, which means that, you know, the risk of you being hospitalized with COVID is 10,000 times compared with the a side effect, right? And the risk of you dying from COVID is 300 times. So I hope this would drive in your, in, in your consciousness about the, the danger of COVID and the relative safety of our vaccines. Okay, there you are. Now, and they take it very seriously. So the FDA, FDA says that you must have at least six weeks of data because 90% of all adverse effects appears within the first six weeks. So what I'm saying is that they are doing at least six weeks to ensure that they are safe and then they require a minimum of 3,000 participants. I will show you the number of participants that they, that they have in their studies. So just to demonstrate to you that safety is a priority. Of course, we're giving vaccines to healthy people. And that's why even after giving out the vaccine, they make sure that they follow up this patient daily for the first six weeks and weekly for the next six, five weeks. Next, efficacy. Now, the FDA and the World Health Organization has set the bar at 50% efficacy. This is the modern vaccine. It's been in business for the past 30 years. It, it may, it's maybe one year for, for many of you, for most of you, but they have nine vaccines in phase two trials. So when the Chinese released the genome in January, by two months in March, they already produced a vaccine. So they are at the cutting edge of mRNA technology. These are the papers. Why I'm showing you the papers? Papers because we are evidence-based. Because there are some guys out there, learned guys saying that there's not enough data. They're just too lazy to read the scientific papers. This is how mRNA work, works. The, 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 the spike protein, right? Sorry, the mRNA, mRNA is synthesized, right? So it's synthetic, so it's a chemical. It is enveloped in a nanoparticle and then it, it, it is introduced to the body. It stays in the cytoplasm. It does not go into the nucleus, so it does not mess up with your DNA. And then it induces the formation of your spike protein, which, which releases the immune response, i.e. protective antibodies, memory cells, cytokines. It is the cytokines that causes all the so-called adverse effects. You know, it's actually a good reaction that the body is producing antibodies. And of course, immune memory. This is the Oxford that uses adenovirus vectors. And again, this is the paper from the Lancet. Now I've summarized the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Look at the numbers, 43,000, 30,000, 20,000 for the AstraZeneca study. And with the mRNA, it is 95% protective, which means that it prevents 95% of the vaccinees from getting COVID. 5% still get COVID. You know, medicine is not an a, 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 a absolute science. So you get this 5%, but the 5% who do get COVID, it is mild. They are not hospitalized. They do not require uh, oxygen. They do not require care in an intensive care unit, okay? Right, we mentioned about the anaphylaxis, that's 4.7 per million. And uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, has got funding from the World Health Organization, so it's probably the cheapest vaccine. It's affordable. AstraZeneca spent six billion USD, yeah? so it's not a cheap vaccine, actually. This is the Russian vaccine, Sputnik V, uh, based on adenovector, JNG adenovector, and Novavax, this is the viral protein. Look again, 43,000. They are all very efficacious. They All of the vaccines prevent from severe uh, severe um, um, COVID disease, i.e., if you get the vaccine, you will not be hospitalized. You will not require oxygen. You do not die from the disease, okay? Hardly any major adverse effects. The advantage of J&J is that it's used once a day. And they can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade. These are the Chinese vaccines, Sinopharm, Sinovac, inactivated, right? Um, their efficacy ranging between 50% to 86%. Now, I need to talk about the ingredients because 
the anti-vaxxers would say we put poisons in the vaccine, whilst the bigots, you know, from all religions, we say, in, in, in the Muslims, they say we put a non-permissible uh, porcine, bovine uh, in the vaccine. But look at the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna vaccine, it's chemicals, mRNA, lipids, polyethylene glycol, cholesterol, and chemicals and sucrose. There's no aluminum, there's no mercury, there's no bovine, there's no gelatin, there's no animal protein. So it debunks the anti-vaxxers and the, the Muslim bigots. This is now how we roll out it in Malaysia. Um, we've got 40% from Pfizer. AstraZeneca has got 20, actually it's 20% from COVAX and direct from AstraZeneca. Sinovac, the Chinese vaccine, is another 20%. CanSinobio, which is another Chinese vaccine, is 10%. And the Russian Sputnik V is another 10%. So we got about 100% for the population of 32.7 million. We need to target 70 to 80%. Yeah? And this is basically a rundown of the cost. We have bought the Pfizer vaccine. The, the registered cost is 20 USD per shot. I think we're getting it much lesser. And as I mentioned to you, the cheapest and most affordable is the AstraZeneca vaccine. Right? Whom do we vaccinate? Basically, there are two major criteria. One is persons who are important towards normal societal function, i.e. doctors, health care workers, because they make sure that the hospital and healthcare facilities are up and running. And of course, for our safety, for our peace, our armed forces, our police, our fire brigade, yeah? And then our other essential workers and the other group that we need to protect are those who are at high risk of death, high risk of illnesses. And these are the, the elderly above 65, the long-term care facility residents, yeah? Those with comorbidities, high blood pressure, uh, uh, diabetes, and the like. This is very quickly looking at the rollout in Malaysia. This is daily COVID vaccines per 100 people, again, per population. And we are right down here in contrast to Israel, United Arab Emirates, UK, and United States. Okay, uh, We were slow to start in February 24th. And there you are. This is daily vaccine doses per 100 people, we are 0.05 per 100 people, right? Uh, <clears throat> and this is the share of people who have re received at least one dose, only 0 0.0, 0 0.3. Imagine, we are targeting 70 to 80% and we're only at 0.3%. Again, to remind ourselves, these are our target groups, the healthcare workers, those beyond 60, those with chronic comorbidities. This is the situation in Selangor. We are in Selangor. This is Selangka, one of the best apps you will ever have in Malaysia. This is in yellow, the Selangka QR. They were the first to start the QR. But when the Ministry of Health stopped the sharing of information, no one dared to tap on Selangka. And this is what happened to them both cases in Selangor. Right? It just spiral all right we had a tsunami of cases because we didn't ex have access to, to 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 cases which we could find what we call find test trace isolate and support and look at at slango we are probably third after labuan and and kuala lumpur so the burden of disease in slango is very high but despite that Look at our case fatality rate. It is one of the lowest. This is Malaysia, right? Right? Uh, uh, 0.38, right? This is Slango, 0.28. So despite the burden, we're doing very well. But it's very upsetting because we're seeing the most cases and yet the vaccination in Slango is the lowest. Terribly upsetting, you know. That means the, 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 the vaccine rollout has not been equitable. The guys as long are working very hard battling COVID. They are not getting they are, the, the, the vaccines are sitting in the fridges, not being administered to our to our frontliners. And I think I got another three minutes very quickly. Fact check. This is extremely important because there's so much of fake news on, 
on social media. And I've picked this verse from the Quran because there are many scholars, ustas, who are spreading fake news, yeah? And, and uh, conspiracy theories, like this one here, right? Enam mau ujian percubaan vaksin. When the vaccine was first launched in December, yeah? The first results came out, yeah? The six that died, four were in placebo, two were in the vaccine arm, okay? Right? And the two guys who died from, from the vaccine was 57 days after taking the vaccine. This is gross fake news. And this is, uh, um, this is uh, the facial palsy, Bell's palsy. You remember there was one doctor in Kuala Lumpur, you know, who was scaremongering and showed that face, how we were drooling, you know, very frightening. These are all uh, very upsetting. And to imagine that he was a doctor spreading this sort of nonsense, yeah? This nurse, right, in Nashville had Bell's palsy. But when they checked up, right, there was no record of any nurse by that name. So there is no direct link between the vaccine and the Bell's palsy. The rates are similar. In fact, if anything, the rates in the general population is 3.5 times higher compared to in the study. Uh, this, again, this is, this is blatant, uh, blatant um, lying, yeah? The nurse who had the, who had the shot and fainted, well, the, 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 the anti-vaxxers went to town and said she died. They actually said she died. She woke up a few minutes later and said that, um, you know, I usually get this lah when, I, when I get a shot. This is, this is what we call a vasovagal response, you know? Medical students and, 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 and interns should know this, yeah? And of course, the issue in Norway, yeah? When elderly died, 33 of them died after taking the vaccine. So the Minister of Health in Norway said, in Norway, those above 75, 45 of them die every day. So this is not unusual and it's unrelated to the vaccine. And this was confirmed, not just by the Ministry of Health in Norway, but also by the World Health Organization. So ladies and gentlemen, I think I've just um, about finished here. I hope with the presentation, I've convinced you that the vaccine is safe, that the vaccine is efficacious. And from the perspective of the, the Muslims, right? It is halal and toyiban. What it means is that not only it is permissible, not only it is uh, suci, it is very good, right? It does a whole lot of good for the for the ummah. So thank you very much uh, to 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 the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Um, I'm sorry, 20 minutes is a very short time to talk about a huge topic, but I'll try and answer some of your questions on the on the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Musa. Um, there has been uh, some questions actually. Um, uh, could you see the chat? I actually have grouped them uh, for your uh, convenience. I think the first question uh, a lot of people have been asking um, is, you know, relates to incidences during rollouts. Huh? Uh, giving an example, uh, mainly like the AstraZeneca, where there are reports of deaths and you know, thromboembolism, etc. I think the uh, to differentiate uh, incidents of something happening as whether it's a cause or not a cause of the vaccine. Maybe you want to say something about that? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, AstraZeneca has been fraught with issues since uh, the trials. In the trials, you will notice that they had issues with dosing, right? And then there were concerns that it is not effective in the elderly. For a while, Germany stopped it, and then Korea and Japan stopped it, and then uh, most recently, it was uh, blood clots. Now, AstraZeneca is an extremely, sorry, Astra, the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine is an extremely good vaccine. It is used from zero, and then the second dose is 12 months, and the efficacy is 82%. And that's why you can prolong the second dose. And the British have used 11 million doses, and there has not been excess death from thromboembolism. So the concern in Norway, Iceland, and Denmark is fine. They're doing their, 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 this moratorium for two weeks, 
And I bet you at the end of two weeks, they will, they will give a green light. And even with the use in the elderly, Germany has now allowed it to be used in the elderly. Now, by the way, AstraZeneca and Pfizer are the only two vaccines that is recognized by the WHO for early and limited use, okay? And the only issue with AstraZeneca is that it is not effective in with the South African strain. Yep, it's only 10% effective. So that's why it was withdrawn from South Africa. So we have 20% investment in AstraZeneca and I think we should go ahead. There are no issues. Thanks, uh, Prof. Um, another question actually relates to um, indications and contraindications of vaccines. Uh, one example of the question was, uh, can lactating mothers uh, get the vaccine? So maybe okay. think of what, who it. cannot get, who should yeah. think twice before getting. Yeah. Right, okay. okay. Now, let, let, let us be very clear. The mRNA vaccines, as I mentioned to you, stays in the cytoplasm. It does not enter the nucleus. So it would not damage your genome. So there's no issue with congenital abnormalities. There is no issue with teratogenicity. In fact, Moderna have done preclinical trials in pregnant rats, right? They gave the vaccine to pregnant rats. When they look at the fetuses and the, and the, and the offsprings, there were no indications of teratogenicity or congenital abnormalities, okay? And secondly, mRNA is very fragile. That's why it needs to be under minus 70, right? or it would, it would uh, degrade itself. So it is not uh, problematic in the system. So that's why the CDC and the, and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the American College of Fetal Medicine have said that it is okay to use in pregnant women and lactating mothers. It is an, uh, it's not an issue. Only that the WHO and, and Malaysia are very cautious. So what they say is that if the if the benefit is, is better than is overweight, sorry, outweighs the risk, then you use it. Right. So I think scientifically, no issues. We'd like to say any group specifically uh, contraindicated for the vaccine. Oh, yeah. Uh, basically, number one, uh, not indicated in kids under 18. Number two, those who have uh, allergies to, to constituents of the vaccine, basically polyethylene glycol. And polysorbate, polysorbates are emulsifiers that you find a lot in food, and 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 those who have suffered an anaphylactic reaction. Okay, if you have allergies, food allergies, drug allergies, then what we say is take the vaccine, stay in the hospital for the next half an hour. We'll monitor you, and most of the time, it should be a, uh, it should be okay. Right, and those are uh, lactating as well. I, uh, there's no, no issues, no issues for lactating, right? Yeah, thank you. Um, um the um. Sorry, a few more questions. Um, the uh, are there um, um, what are side adverse side effects of um, vaccine uh, in Malaysia to date? What are the other severe side effects okay. of vaccinated? I don't know whether we know. We as, don't, as I but... mentioned to you, the the only troublesome side effect is with with Pfizer vaccine is four point six per million anaphylaxis. With the Moderna vaccine is 2.5 per million, and I give it. I've given you a comparison with 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 peanut allergy. Yeah, all right. Okay, so that is the only major one. The other adverse effects are mild. For example, you get the shot, pain, 80 percent pain. Of course, it's an injection. Yeah, and uh, tenderness and redness is about five to six percent. And then you will get headaches, 60 percent. You can get giddiness. You can get a myalgia, muscle pains. Yeah, that's about 30 percent. You can get fever. 18, sorry, 15%, right? And it is said that it is the second shot that you get most of these adverse effects. Most of these adverse effects are actually physiological. They are because of the cytokines that is released, yeah? So for us doctors who are into vaccinology, if you see these side effects, you get really excited. That means you know your immune system is working. So these are actually good signs. A few of us, of course, get worse than other, and that's why they take one day or, or two days MC leave, uh, of, of um, MC. So generally, the adverse effects are, are, are transient and usually disappears by 48 hours. So some say that they have like severe, uh, they have lots of allergic reactions to like NLG sears, aspirins, etc. No, can no, they take the no adverse effects to this. You can take the vaccine. 
and the um, and some have other diseases like diabetes. Okay. And, uh, now, mm -hmm. if you if you have diabetes, if you have renal disease, you are having a comorbidity. You are one of the high risk groups. Okay, right. And then if you have a, a, a solid tumor, if you've undergone bone marrow transplant, if you have a, a hematological cancer, if you have leukemia. Uh, if you have a rheumatoid arthritis, you have lupus erythematosus, uh, or you on intravenous steroids, you on intravenous immunosuppressants, you are high risk. If you have HIV, I mean, Chris will talk about it, you are high risk. These are the very people who need the vaccine because if you get COVID, it will be very severe. You very, very likely will end up in the intensive care unit. So you must get the vaccine you need to negotiate, have a chat with your rheumatologist or your oncologist to make sure that your medicines are at the bare minimum to control the symptoms because you need a good immune system to produce good antibodies, right? So if you're on immunosuppressant, probably the lowest dose so that you can produce good antibodies against your, your, your spike protein. Yep. And some ask about long-term side effects. mRNA vaccines today, uh, they're prone to cause uh, as I immune you, disease. As I mentioned to you, the FDA, the WHO has said that most of the side effects occur within the first two months. In fact, most of it occur within the first... Anaphylaxis within the first 30, 30 minutes, right? Your, your, your other adverse effects within the first 48 hours. Live, your lymph adenopathy within one week. If you look at the other childhood vaccines, all of them occur within the first two to three weeks. So you're not talking about there's hardly any long-term adverse effects. Yeah, usually it should appear within the first two months. Yep. Yes. So another some questions about um, uh, studies about quality of antibodies present to put. Uh, any studies on quantity of antibodies to be present to give protection and how long? And then some other person also asked a very similar question, like after six to nine months, uh, antibodies hang out, what, what happens next when the antibody wears out? You know, how long can this last? Okay, when you get natural COVID, yeah, your antibodies actually are persistent for five to six months and then they begin to wave. That is why if you have had COVID, you will require the vaccine, right? What the vaccine does is that it ramps up your antibodies. Not only it ramps up your protective antibodies, it also um, ramp, uh, um, um, boosts your immune memory cell, your T cells. Yeah. So this makes sure that it becomes durable, longer. It becomes sustainable, and we are not sure. What we can tell you is that at this point in time, the four endemic coronavirus that we have. Yeah. We've got seven coronavirus. Okay. The four are endemic, and then you've got MERS-CoV, and then you've got SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So the four endemic ones, the protection is about one year. So minimum probably one year, maybe even longer. So <clears throat> our trials are not that long enough to tell us how long right? the, 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 the antibodies are protective. So yeah, that means um, uh, more data will come in the future, then you'll know when, whether you need a booster or not. Yeah, so I think there's another question about uh, those who oh, have yeah. already uh, had COVID. Ellen, yeah. Ellen, it, it, mm. is, it is mandated to all, the, to all the researchers or to all the vaccine manufacturers that you must continue to study for up to 30 months. So that's what, two and a half years. Then we will know better how long the antibodies last, whether they wane and whether you need a booster. We'd like to speak, uh, mention there's a question about those who have been affected by COVID before and, have, and they have recovered, should they take the vaccine? Oh, yes, the answer is yes. I answered it earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and uh, a few others is on, um, yeah, we're running okay, out this, of time. This, this, uh, this, this one, can I get uh, for fever like Panadol? You know what mm -hmm. I'm telling you? You know, they did some trials with the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So because they were anticipating fever, they gave the children ibuprofen. So when they did the GMTs, the geometric mean titers, they found that those who took ibuprofen, the levels of the antibodies were lower. So now the general teaching is that unless you have a fever, you do not take Panadol before or after unless you are really unwell because that fever is a good reaction. It tells us that your immune system is producing the protective antibodies, all right? So Panadol, and the light would only attenuate the production of your protective antibodies. Right. 
um okay it's about vaccine preference some people like talking about preferring one vaccine to another um, okay what's your opinion on that? my general message to the public in Malaysia is if you can get any vaccine you grab it because there is a lack of numbers that's why we're doing it stages you know because we don't have enough numbers there is a paucity of supply you think uh, the, the, the manufacturers can, can roll out vaccines overnight. No, they're scrambling among each other looking for the raw materials. So any vaccines you can grab or you're offered, take it. Now, that's why I am appealing to the Ministry of Health, to the National Security Council, that you should make the vaccine available in the private hospitals. As it is, myself and my colleagues in private hospitals are doing about 30 to 40% of the vaccination in the National Immunization, immunization Program. I mean, this, this morning's clinic, I did about 20 kids, you know, for their flu shots, for their measles, mumps, rubella shot, for their diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough shot. I mean, it's uh, my bread and butter, you know. So I just can't understand why I did delaying it for us in the private sector, because we will not pinch from the stockpile in the Ministry of Health. If anything, if we take away 30% from the MOH stockpile, you create more spaces so that more people can get the vaccine and you can get the B40s, the M40s, who can't afford to, 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 for the vaccine. Whilst there are people, I was just speaking to a, a young entrepreneur. He said, doctor, I'm at the bottom of the heap. When will I get my vaccine? What about the expatriates? They've been coming to me with their children for the vaccine. They will be bottom of the heap. What about the uh, refugees? What about the, in, 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 uh, the migrant workers? Yeah, they are... They are the bastions of our industry in Slango. Can you imagine uh, if they are sick with COVID, the factories will bunkos, man. If the factories bunkos in Slango, there goes their tax dollars. And Slango provides 25% 25% of GDP. That's why Slango is trying to acquire vaccine for the migrant workers. You see, so that's where this the, the, we need to see it as a collaboration with the Ministry of Health. You know, don't see us in the private sector as competitors. This is what we call private-public partnership. This needs to get into the minds of the, of, the, of the government and the Ministry of Health. Okay? So we want to help them. I mean, I was in Subang Jaya. They were doing 48 a day. Hello, in my own clinic, I do 20 a day, man. A whole hospital doing only for 48 people. Total waste of, 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 of expertise, vaccinators, you know, they had about 50 people lie, lie at us, you know. So I hope this message gets across to the, um, to the uh, powers that be. Okay, I think we are running short of time. Maybe just last question about uh, you know, the vaccines from China and from, um, from uh, India. Some uh, comments saying that we don't, why we don't get, why we are not getting the vaccine from India. And another one says, how about how, about how much data we have of the vaccines from China? We don't hear much of well, that. Okay. Well, I have my issues with 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 uh, with 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 a vaccine from China because China has not published the phase three trials in any peer-reviewed scientific journal. So I have my issues. Yeah, even though in the press they say Sinovac has got fifty percent efficacy in Brazil and eighty-five percent efficacy in Tur Turkey, sixty-five percent efficacy in, in 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 Indonesia, very different numbers. Sinopharm has got seventy-nine efficacy in China and in the UAE studies, Arab Emirates, it's eighty-six percent. I want to see the phase three trials. We're not seeing that, but yet NPRA has already given uh, uh, early and limited uh, license to Sinovac. I wish they would show us the, 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 the evidence for this. And yet they have not licensed Moderna. Moderna is acceptable in about 40 countries. Yeah? And Sputnik, Sputnik has been published in uh, Lancet. It's a, it's a top tier journal and yet still not licensed. They have submitted for licensing. So I hope they will do similarly for this. Now, Indian vaccines, India has got two. Cover Shield. Cover Shield is actually a version of AstraZeneca. So no issues. But the good thing about India is that Serum Institute can roll out 100 million doses in one month. So they can do 1.2 billion. But India has got 1.x uh, billion. So they need for the population. Covaxin. Covaxin is another uh, a non uh, sorry is another inactivated vaccine. It's from Bharat Biotech. It's in house use. There were some political issues. Can you imagine? AstraZeneca, uh, Covishield is recognized by WHO. 
yet Covaxin was issued by the Indian government at I think it was 16 ringgit. And this internationally known vaccine, uh, AstraZeneca was 11 ringgit. You see, there's a lot of corruption there. Someone was getting kickbacks from the Bi Bharat Biotech vaccine. And I bet you we have similar issues uh, all over the world. And I think Malaysia is no exception. There is some people are profiting from this pandemic. It is sad, you know. People are losing business. Families are, uh, are losing livelihood. Some of our relatives have died and people are profiting from this pandemic. It is nonsensical. And I will, I will not keep quiet with this nonsense. I mean, I, I, you, I can pass you the article if you want to see. I, 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 this, is not, this is not fake news. This was established in the literature. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Dato. Uh, uh, we need to move on to the next uh, speaker. Um, next speaker, uh, uh, Dato Professor Dr. Christopher Lee. Uh, he's the Infectious Disease Specialist, President of Malaysian AIDS Council, one of the pioneers in infectious disease specialists in Malaysia. Um, he's currently a member of the Selangor Task Force on COVID-19, Infectious Disease Consultant uh, Physician at Hospital Sungai Bulo, and since retiring as the Deputy Director General of Health uh, Research and Technical Support of Ministry of Health Malaysia in early 2020, has been busy with NGOs like uh, the Malaysian Aid Council and active in COVID-19 response uh, as the chairperson of the National COVID-19 Mortality Review Committee in the MOH and a member of Slango Task Force uh, on COVID-19. It's also an adjunct professor at Taylor's University here. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Over to yes. you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always wonderful to listen to Musa. I mean, I was so enthralled by what he had to say. I forgot I was giving a talk myself. Uh, so maybe you should have given Musa more time. Uh, right. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Right. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Musa. We, we, we seem to see each other in, in webinars all the time. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 That's how we spend the weekend, isn't it? Right. Okay. Uh, first, let me thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I will try to be brief. Uh, I probably will be able to do that because uh, some of the things uh, has been made easier uh, for me because Musa had given that introduction. So in areas that I think uh, Musa has covered, uh, uh, very well. I will probably just run through the slide and perhaps we have a bit more time for, for Q&A. Now, uh, let me go back a little bit in, in terms of uh, looking at how important the vaccines are. And I think all of us, as uh, Alan mentioned just now, it seems to be our main uh, weapon in as we approach the end game. Uh, but I think it's important to remember why we look forward to vaccines so much. We have seen one year of significant morbidity and mortality around the world. We have seen very quick and rapid and large scale transmission in communities very, very quickly. We just have to remember our top glove situation and we know how fast things can turn south. Uh, we know how our healthcare facilities can be overwhelmed. And a couple of months ago, and I think our DG of Health uh, had to call an emergency uh, in terms of healthcare uh, care of big COVID patients and asking all, all hospitals, including private hospitals, to take over the care of their own COVID patients. Uh, uh, things have settled somewhat uh, since that, that high peak times, but nevertheless, I think in some other countries, including America, in Brazil in particular, their healthcare facilities, especially ICUs, are really, really overrun. Something we sh haven't talked enough, of, but certainly there's data to show there's also a lot of collateral damage not just people dying uh, from COVID directly, but also people dying and suffering from the other NCDs because our focus is on so much on, on, on COVID and rightly so, uh, we have taken our eye away from the other health conditions. Uh, look at Sungai Bulo. All our services have been literally closed except for COVID and all our patients have been diverted to other hospitals. I hope not that many have fallen through the cracks. Uh, we have seen a uh, lot of social and developmental and economic disruption. Our children have not been going to school for God knows how long now. Uh, Musa talked about livelihoods, and I think all of us know, looking at not just our stock market, but looking at the small and medium uh, businesses, how badly they are affected, especially workers who are doing daily, being daily paid. When they don't work, they don't get paid. 
So a lot of people are suffering uh, from this uh, from this COVID uh, pandemic, not just from the disease itself, but also from our interventions. So every time we have an MCO, of course it will bring the numbers down. But every time we bring we put on the MCOs, we are causing a lot of damage as well. Something I think we have seen as the pandemic went on and on. Initially, uh, people could weather it, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you could weather it. But as the pandemic went on, I think clearly it showed the social disparities. And in fact, the social disparities became broader. Really, it became the haves and the have-nots. And uh, more and more countries, including what's happening in the States, Joe Biden has looked at the have-nots to help them tide over uh, this difficult time. Now, how have we dealt before the, the, the onset of the, the advent of the vaccines coming through? Well, many, we were doing this, and I think Musa alluded to that to some degree, that is uh, to find, to test, to trace, to isolate, and to support uh, these five principles in public health management of COVID-19. Now you can argue how well did we do in Malaysia? I think I mean, some people will say we did okay. Some may say we could have done better. And I leave that for you to make your own conclusion. But having said that, some countries have done extremely well. And I think Taiwan, uh, Singapore has done well, New Zealand, Australia. You might say they were island countries and they did well because of that, perhaps. Uh, but some countries have done better than, than others. But that is why we are all looking forward to this because public health measures can help return, uh, uh, address, uh, sorry, address issues like morbidity and mortality and cut down transmission. But it's, it's difficult to return normalcy. Vaccine is one of those interventions that will do all the things I've mentioned earlier and hopefully return a fair amount of normalcy in our lives. And to do that, we really were talking about herd immunity and something that Musa talked about just now. So herd immunity is getting large numbers of our population uh, vaccinated. But where do we stand in, on vaccines now? This is the looking at the vaccination status around the world. Uh, up to a few days ago, we have about 300 over million uh, doses, not individual doses, even around the world. As you can see from this map, you can see the darker the color, the more people vaccinated in uh, at least getting one dose uh, in, in those countries. Uh, if you're looking for Malaysia, it's, it's quite faint. Uh, you can see uh, somewhere, uh, if you're somewhere, as I think Musa mentioned 0 0.3 something, probably pretty low down. Basically, we just started. For us to get to herd immunity, it's going to take time. I'm not here to debate how long it will take, but the way we are doing now, it's going to take quite a bit of time. Uh, right. Now look at the countries, I think uh, Musa showed some of these slides and I'm sure it's showing this combination. Looking at Israel, Israel the country it has, has done the best in terms of getting uh, shots uh, into arms of their own citizens. And uh, here more than nearly 60% of uh, the folks in Israel have got at least one shot of the vaccine so far. Uh, if you're looking for Malaysia, it's, it's somewhere at the bottom. All right. okay. So we have a long way to go. Now, why am I highlighting this? The vaccines are going to come in stages. I think you know there is a scarcity to some degree or maldistribution, you can argue that as well. But it will take time for all the vaccines to come through. And it will take time for the infrastructure, whatever infrastructure the government has put aside, hopefully, hopefully it's adequate, to roll it up. So it will take time. Uh, so in the interim period, what should we do? Do we vaccinate everybody equally, We're starting from person with a, starting with the A alphabet to the ending at the Z alphabet, obviously that doesn't make sense. So we obviously have to look at who is most at risk of suffering the ill effects of COVID and who is more likely to die. So let's go back to the very beginning and this is data from, from Wuhan itself uh, in the first few months of the Wuhan uh, 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 epidemic then. Uh, these were the people who were admitted to hospitals when Wuhan got exploded, not everybody got admitted, but those who were unwell were admitted. And when you look at those patients who were admitted in the Wuhan hospitals, these are the people, these are the comorbidities they, they identified. And this is common knowledge to us now, hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, diabetes, and the like. 
uh, something he didn't hide, like here is lower down, I, I cut short this slide, is chronic kidney disease. And that is a real uh, problem for our patients who have CKD because their outcome tends to be rather poor. So let's look at some other data. I mean, I wanted to go away from China and look at before Donald Trump calls it a Wuhan virus again. So let's look at some other places. And I looked at UK. And instead of looking at the Public Health England's data, I looked from this uh, private side because I know I was sharing the stage with, with Musa. So I okay, I'll pick up some private insurance uh, data. This is from the UK. Uh, this is one of the larger private health care uh, databases that they have there. And they look at 500 thousand COVID-19 patients diagnosed from April to August of last year. And what they did is look at the mortality and the variables such as age, gender, and other pre-existing conditions. And, and some of their findings, I'm just highly concerned some of their findings, was this. When you look at chronic kidney disease and heart failure, when you look at across all age groups, whether you're young or old, patients with COVID-19 and CKD were two times more likely to die than those who had no CKD. And in those who have heart failure and COVID-19 were more than one and a half times more likely to die than those with no heart disease or heart failure. The other important thing I want to highlight is the reverse, the other side of the coin. They also found that those patients with COVID-19 who had no comorbidities tend to do extremely well. The bottom line was of all those patients with COVID-19 who died, 83% had at least one pre-existing comorbidity. So only about 17% uh, of people who died of COVID did not have pre-existing comorbidity. So this type of data gives us an idea who needs the vaccine most, who needs the vaccine first. Some other data here. Uh, okay, I'm not going to discuss this because we all know males are more likely to die from COVID. I'm not suggesting we give the vaccine to males first. Uh, the women will get very upset because just a few days ago we had uh, International Women's Day. So I, I'm not going to go there. But the data is uh, consistent all around the world. Uh, however, if you uh, uh, look at all the other variable risk factors, this difference in mortality between males and females uh, tends to narrow a little bit. In terms of age, and this is by far the most uh, important finding that we know now, and Musa has talked about it as well. Uh, patients who are aged 70 years and above accounted for only 4.8% of all COVID diagnoses in the Fair Health Study in the UK. Only 4.82% of their COVID cases were people older than 70. But when they look at the deaths, these people who are more than 70 years of age uh, made up 42% of all deaths due to COVID-19. So they are overrepresented in the mortality uh, in COVID-19. They have also found another interesting finding, which I think is pretty intuitive in the sense that the more comorbidities you have, it seems to add up. And so your odds of dying actually increase as you have more and more comorbidities. And as someone who's getting older, every time I meet my old classmates, uh, we often compare how many comorbidities we all have and we compare who has more pills and who has less pills. Uh. Very sad, very sad. This is just a pictorial uh, uh, depiction of what I've told you about. I just want to highlight this again. Uh, on the left-hand side, if you look at patients who have a COVID-19 diagnosis, you can see those with comorbidities and those with no comor comorbidities, they made up about 50-50, it's about even. But when they look at the, those who died of COVID-19, all right, as I mentioned just now, 83% had a comorbidity. So you really hope uh, if you want to be safer with COVID-19, hopefully you stay in this category. Uh, age, I will talk about age a lot, uh, partially because I'm getting older, but well, age is a major thing as far as uh, COVID mortalities are concerned. Here is looking at COVID-19 diagnosis in, in regards to age. I just want to highlight here, uh, these three sectors here, these are patients between 50 and 59, 60 to 69 and 70 and above. And as you can see, they make up about nearly 30 over percent, maybe, maybe one third, slightly more than one third of the whole uh, COVID-19 cohort. But when they look at those who died, uh, looking at this, looking at this, looking at this, they make up 80 over percent of all those who died. So they really overrepresent 
they are already overrepresented when it comes to COVID-19 deaths. So I, I do not want to belabor uh, this, uh, this issue, but it has to be emphasized. The older folks are at serious risk. So I think it, uh, for your families at home, your grandparents or your parents, I, I hope you get this message across to them. Get them to the vaccine as soon as you can. Well, even look at old people, there are lots of old people down, you know. Uh, uh, Musa says he's 60 or so, I actually don't believe him, but okay, anyway, I wouldn't argue with him now. Uh, but age, more and more of us are getting over, over that, that little horizon when we talk about age. So even among the older folks, there are some people that even at higher risk. And you will see later how, for example, the UK folks uh, prioritize their vaccine rollout. Now, this study looked at uh, this, I think this is Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Rome, sorry, this was in Rome. And they look at people, uh, of, uh, this is a geriatric uh, paper, so looking at people uh, older than 65. And what they found was in conclusion was that uh, age, of course, is an odds ratio of 1.099, slightly higher. But when they look at comorbidities, it was 1.7 times higher. When they look at, uh, this is uh, their version of uh, long-term care facilities or, or aged care homes like, or nursing homes, if you like, uh, the risk was 2.68 times higher. So putting it all together, even among those who are elderly, the older you are, especially more than 80, especially if you have multiple comorbidities, and especially if you are in aged care homes or nursing homes, you are at the highest risk of dying because of frailty. Uh, to the fact that most failed people tend to end up in nursing homes uh, are more likely to perish from COVID-19. So clearly when the vaccine hopefully come in, comes in on time, I hope the government does not forget uh, our senior colleagues, our senior families who are living in this aged care facilities all over the country. They must be at the top of the list of getting it when we are rolling out our vaccines. Now, I'm going to go to this slide. Obviously, I talk about age. I'm going to move a little bit to the comorbidities. I showed you some of the data earlier. Uh, I'll be showing you a lot of uh, forest plots uh, to look at the various uh, comorbidities in terms of risk to COVID-19 mortality. Now, this is a meta-analysis looking at 20 studies involving about 60 over 1,000 uh, COVID-19 cases. I, I want to state that majority of these studies were from China because they collected this in the late part of uh, last year. So most of the cases came from China, but there was one study from Italy, two from the States, and one was a multinational uh, study. I'll go through it very quickly, uh, just, to in, uh, just for you, those of you who are not so familiar with forest plots, just look at this. This is looking at hypertension. These are all the studies they looked at. Uh, just look at this. This is the line of unity, all right? Anything that falls on the right-hand side tells you there is increased risk of mortality. All right, as you can see here, most of these dots fall on the right-hand side of, of this line or the vertical line here. And this is the overall uh, representation of that risk. Uh, it's well beyond this line of unity. Uh, therefore, the hypertension is, uh, uh, unit, is a risk factor for COVID-19 mortality. That's the easiest way to look at this uh, forest plots. Diabetes, things look very similar as well. So there is a well-known risk factor. Here, respiratory disease, similarly. Cardiovascular disease, similarly. Cerebral vascular disease, similarly. Kidney disease, I mentioned it many times in our country. We have so many clusters among our dialysis centers. I know that, and we have lost quite a number of them. Liver disease, not as much. And this is similarly what we find in, in uh, Sungai Below as well. Uh, certainly, we have a lot more problems with very ill COVID cases with chronic kidney disease then with liver disease and, and, and uh, I, I'm not really sure what's the reason really, but clearly I think it's the case. Uh, cancer, as uh, Musa mentioned, is a well-known risk factor. Uh, uh, cancer is certainly a risk and patients who have cancer or being treated with cancer should be prioritized for, for vaccines. Now, I'm going to talk about group, uh, uh, I think Musa was thinking I'm going to talk about this anyway. Well, I'm president of the Nation AIDS Council, I, I do need to talk about this. Um, COVID-19 deaths in people living with HIV. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Minister of Health uh, gave a video, a video clip, to say that patients with HIV should not be given the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, they will not recommend it. So the, the reason apparently, I was told later that 
uh, some people in the ministry thought that the uh, effects will not be so good. Uh, they will not be able to take the vaccine as well. The benefits will not be there. Uh, I certainly would like to challenge that, but we'll go through these few slides first. Now, this is looking at the open safe, uh, safety database. It's the like electron medical records data from the NHS, large population of patients. And they looked at uh, all those COVID uh, patients uh, and they found that uh, out of the, the, they found that in their cohort, they had 27,000 adults with HIV who got COVID-19 and 17 plus million who didn't have COVID-19. So when they, they looked at the deaths, uh, 14,000 over deaths uh, were recorded in their cohort. 29 were people living with HIV and 14,800 were people without HIV. So when they look at the, the, the cumulative mortality rate, and that's just looking at HIV status, huh? not looking at their immune function, the status of their immune function, they found that uh, in patients with HIV, there was one death in every 1,149 people. And in people without HIV, it was one death in 2,639 people. So just a quick eyeballing, it will appear that the people living with HIV had a risk of two times higher risk at least of dying of COVID-19. And this was their conclusion. They found that it was about 2.9 times higher after adjusting for, it, uh, for, for gender and for age. But when they also adjusted for the other risk factors, they found that the, uh, the risk dropped a little bit to about 2.3%. So clearly, uh, HIV is clearly a risk factor for a poor outcome uh, in COVID-19. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with HIV. As you know, HIV has a spectrum of disease. Some people are very asymptomatic, some people are very sick, and they can divide it according to stages. Here, they look at the stages. This is another study. They look at the stages of HIV. And to summarize this very quickly, what they found was the hospitalization, hospitalization risk of COVID disease uh, increased with the HIV staging. So if they look at HIV stage as your, your, your benchmark, they found that if you are in stage two, your, uh, your relative risk of, of hospitalization care will be 1.29 times higher. And if you are in stage three, that means with a lower CD4 count, uh, uh, you are more sick with HIV, your risk of requiring hospitalization increases to 1.69. Uh, so clearly here, HIV is a risk. HIV at a higher uh, with a uh, lower CD4 count with a poor immune function, the risk is even higher. We are running out of time, Dr. Okay, all right. So this looking at, uh, this is summarizing it into the VIVA guidelines, the, the British uh, HIV Association guidelines, and basically it reflects what I've said just now, all right? So COVID-19 patients with uh, people living with HIV, they are basically in group six here, all right? But if they have any of these issues here, that means they are more sick with HIV, their priority list from six goes to number four. And that's how they, the, the UK folks look at the data be, uh, behind their cohort and uh, giving the best evidence that they have up to now, uh, try to prior way they have prioritized their vaccine work. Now, I won't talk much about cancer because I think we, we know that for a fact, we know it very well. I just want to conclude that not all cancer risks are the same. If someone has cancer, the older they are, the higher the mortality, we know that. But even looking at certain cancers, certain cancers, especially those hematological cancers, things like leukemia and myeloma, they are at higher risk of dying right across, whether you're young or old, uh, right across the board, uh, you're more likely to die compared to if you have uh, cancers or solid organ tumor cancers or no cancer at all. So if you have to prioritize among cancer groups, uh, these are the groups you want to get first, the leukemias, the lymphomas, and the myelomas. Pregnant women, I'm not going to say very much already. Uh, Musa talked about it, so I'm going to skip here. But there is a fact, pregnant women are more at risk of, of a poor outcome in COVID-19. Even the fetus, of course, if the mother is very sick, the fetus is going to get in trouble. But even if the mother is okay, uh, they are more likely to go into preterm. Uh, uh, labor, all right? So, okay, getting SARS, uh, COVID, COVID-2 cough in pregnancy is not a good thing. So protect them if we can. Right, so here, so in terms of rolling out, this is the data we want to look at. Uh, here is looking at age, 
all right? If you are 50 to 54, we have to vaccinate 4,000 people, all right, to prevent one death. If you are between 65 to 69, you have to vaccinate about 800 people to prevent one death. But if you are above 80 years of age, you probably need to only give uh, less than 200 uh, uh, vaccinations to prevent one death. And obviously you can see in terms of impact, uh, if you focus on the higher groups, higher age groups, they probably tend to do better. I'm not gonna go through this. We have already discussed that. And I think Musa has already shown you the Malaysian version of it. All I can say here on the ad here is this. This is very vague. We are now here. I hope, and I hope, and I Musa concurs with me, I hope we are getting our act together as we come into April and if our vaccines come on time, I hope we get this group sorted out because this is something this country has never done before. And I, I hope uh, we get our shots into arms of those who need it most first. Once we go to phase three, it doesn't really matter. It's all comers. Anybody who walks in above 18 years of age, we're going to give it to you. you know, as long as you want it, we're going to give it to you because by then the finishing line is her immunity. That's all. All right. Hopefully by then our vaccine supply chain is hopefully well sorted out. Okay. Uh, I've co mobilities have talked about this uh, just to, without going into details here on the left hand side, these are a really high risk group of patients. Yes, on the right hand side, these are the second. Uh, high risk group of patients, all right? So these are, the one on the left is number one priority, the ones on the right is the second list of priorities. Uh, pregnancy, uh, I concur with what uh, Musa said just now, uh, the data is not yet there, but there's no reason to say why the vaccines won't work. And in terms of safety, there's no reason why this, their safety should be an issue. Nevertheless, because the lack of data, they have left it to the individual patient to look at his pros and cons, the risks and benefit with their doctor. But generally, if there's a widespread community spread going on, I would recommend, if there are no other contraindications, I would recommend the pregnant woman to also get their vaccination. Breastfeeding, I won't talk about it. We know children, that's the easy part. Uh, that's why uh, Musa hasn't got more work to do yet. But once we get, and there's data, there's already studies being done for children, and I'm sure Musa will get more busy uh, after that data comes up. I'll just have a few words about variants to leave it very fast. This is going to be, if you watch the Avengers, well, this if there's a Thanos in the end game, the variants may be the ones, all right? But we know B117 very well in the UK. It seems to spread faster. People might say it may kill uh, at a higher rate. However, the good news is they seem to do okay with the current vaccines that we have. The one that we have trouble with is the South African variant of 1351. And the problem with that is uh, the, the, some of the vaccines have not worked as well uh, for, that, for that variant. So that could be a, a problem uh, going forward. Uh, I have already that I'll probably skip that. So now, how, why do we need to worry about variants? Because it will spread faster, usually faster from the from the earlier variants, uh, it may can cause more. It can cause more severe disease. We don't know. New variants to come may cause more severe disease, and there's something we are very worried about. It may affect our diagnostic test, test because our test focuses on the spike protein. Uh, if there are significant changes, well, they might escape our diagnostic test as well. So that could be a problem. Certainly, uh, already some some variants. I think three five one is one example. Uh, when they gave convalescent uh, uh, serum, the antibody response didn't seem to be as, as effective. And lastly, what we are all very worried about is if a variant that comes along that early becomes resistant to our vaccines, then I think all the gains that we have achieved uh, will be lost. So lastly, uh, what happens? What do we deal with it? Well, the good news is this, and um, I, I want to echo what Musa said about the mRNA uh, technology, they are very robust, they are very fast. They can actually tweak things quite easily if they know the changes in the new variant. So uh, getting a, a newer vaccine, if you like, to deal with new, new variants may not be as difficult as we, we, we thought it would be, all right? 
the most important area is genomic surveillance, that we, we need to know if new strains are, new variants are coming up, and then we can work on them. So surveillance is, is the one that's important. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think it's important here to remember, as uh, we heard earlier, the vaccines, we know vaccines prevents hospitalization and death. We do not know for sure whether all the vaccines will prevent infection. There's already some data that some of them do. Uh, and I, I will not be surprised that it does, but the data may not be complete yet in some of these vaccines. But nevertheless, the important thing is this, it will stop you from getting sick and it will stop us from dying of COVID-19. I think that basically is the bottom line. And that seems to be for all the recognized vaccines, the data seems to be extremely strong. That's good news. And this is where we are now. When you look at CNN or BBC, you see other countries ramping up, pushing their vaccine rock very, very aggressively. And this is important. We need to make sure our new infections are low because the more infections you have, the more likely, the more mutations may occur. The more mutations occur, the more likely there'll be a variant. And if one variant comes along, there's resistance or to our vaccines, the effects of our vaccines, then we could be in really big trouble. So for us in Malaysia, while hoping the government get the act together for, for rapid scale up of vaccinations, we have to stick with aggressive public health measures. Uh, and I've talked about FTPIS, that's not the topic for today, but we really need to double down and get that part right to make sure we are ready for the vaccines when it comes. Dead people don't need vaccination, so we, we all have to stay alive. So with that, I thank you for your kind attention and I'm happy to take questions if time permits. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dato. Uh, sorry, because of uh, time limitations, I think there's uh, one question related to uh, something what you mentioned about you know, uh, the vaccine, the who to pr uh, prioritize. Question is that because there's a lot of um, clusters in the workplace, uh, shouldn't they have prioritized also some uh, vaccination workplace? Understand that actually there is a, a group called uh, for Public Health Action, right? Right. I mean, uh, I focus on the clinical aspects who will benefit from the vaccine in terms of health and, mor or, and mortality. But clearly, we also give vaccines to prevent infection, obviously, and to sustain essential services. I think Musa alluded to that. So clearly, I think, uh, I mean, apart from the Slango Task Force, we are also focusing on our industry, our service industry, and also our manufacturing industry. Keeping them open is important. And one quick way of this vaccination. So I'm all for it. So yes, in terms of the social economic part of it, it makes good sense to get them vaccinated. The only thing now is, is the queue, is the, is the supply chain of vaccine. If we have all the vaccines we have, we, we have now in the world with us, it doesn't really matter. We can have multiple parallel tracks of vaccine rollout so that everybody will get the vaccine as soon as possible. But because our stock is limited, we really have to talk about saving lives first. But if we have enough vaccines, we must also explore the channels that Musa talked about, the private sector channel, the manufacturer and the workers channel, and even migrant workers for that. Okay, okay. so thank you very much, uh, Dato. Um, uh, so we have to move on to the next speaker, um, Professor Chong Pei Pei, Head of uh, Research and Faculty of uh, Head of and Medical Sciences of Taylor's University. She's a microbiologist uh, studying the molecular and omics platforms for infectious disease and bioetiologies of uh, uh, related cancers. And she has been actively collaborating with Hospital Sungai Bulo and the Institute of Clinical Research um, or the Ministry of Health, uh, National Institute of Health on COVID-19 research since last year. And she's the uh, professor at the School of Biosciences, Taylor's University. So Professor Chong, um, sorry, this, um, we are a little bit short uh, behind time. So um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. Right, uh, thank you, Prof. Ellen, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Yeah? Okay. Um, I hope my screen is visible now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to share a talk on the topic, research on COVID-19 vaccines. So a brief introduction to the contents uh, of my talk today. 
So uh, this part, the introduction to types of vaccines have been covered well uh, by Dr. Musa. So I will just uh, briefly go through. Uh, I'll go, go on to the usual timeline for vaccine R&D to roll out and compare that to the accelerated timeline for COVID-19 vaccines. And then the steps in vaccine research and development. And then uh, what drives the science behind COVID-19 vaccines? New technologies and platform and R&D efforts for COVID-19 vaccines. So as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to affect countries around the world, the number of cases and deaths are increasing significantly. And as we all know, COVID-19 can cause severe complications in some patients, uh, although in most patients it would be mild or asymptomatic. So some of these uh, severe complications include acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute respiratory failure, and uh, so on. And in some children, it could cause multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is uh, a bit similar to the Kawasaki syndrome. While rigorous testing, contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, and uh, evidence-based public health measures help to control the uh, uh, spread of COVID-19, uh, development and implementation of vaccine will contribute significantly to reduce the threat of severe disease manifestations and death. Researchers are currently testing 74 vaccines in clinical trials on humans, and 21 have reached the final stages of testing, uh, with six being approved so far for full use and four vaccines abandoned after the trials. So let's take a quick look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus structure. So it has an outer shell uh, encasing a single-stranded RNA, or this is the uh, nucleic acid that carries the genetic code of the virus. And uh, sticking out of the outer shell are proteins known as spike proteins, uh, which have a specific three-dimensional structure, and they are recognized and able to bind to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor found on the surface of human cells, including lung cells. So how does the virus infect human cells? The spike protein sticking out of the virus uh, can bind to the receptor on the, uh, on the human cells and then fuse the human cell membrane and enters the cell. Once inside, the RNA from the virus is released where it can then hijack the host system to replicate multiple copies of itself and uh, releasing the progeny viruses so that they can infect other cells. So it causes uh, a lot of uh, effects like inflammation, T cell death and so on, and uh, even multi-organ failure. So how does vaccination help? So the spike proteins, um, uh, are called antigens, okay, antigens. So our immune system, um, uh, these antigens uh, let our immune system know that they are foreign invaders that must be destroyed. The problem is the first time our body encounters the virus, our immune system reacts so slowly that uh, before the virus is recognized and destroyed, um, the virus has already had enough uh, time to make trillions or gazillions copies of itself, and that makes us sick. What a vaccine does is that it trains our immune system and creates a memory of the spike proteins so that when the real virus shows up, our immune system can respond rapidly and destroy the virus before it has a chance to hijack our cells. So what's actually in a vaccine? So there are many possible types of vaccines, which uh, Dr. Musa has uh, also explained. Uh, so I think I will skip this slide. So we have the uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, the protein subunit vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, uh, live recombinant viral vectors, um, the uh, virus-like particles, 
um, the uh, self-activating uh, RNA and also the DNA vaccines. So many different companies are involved in producing uh, the COVID-19 vaccines as shown in this slide here. So the development of vaccines is actually a complicated and lengthy process. There are many steps in uh, the uh, vaccine research development cycle. The first step is the basic research or exploratory phase uh, where scientists tinker around in the labs trying to find out the best vaccine candidates to use as antigens. Uh, and also to figure out the most suitable vaccine delivery platform. This then is followed by the uh, preclinical uh, phase, um, whereby uh, uh, the uh, ability of these vaccine formulations to stimulate an appropriate uh, or strong enough immune response in animals is being assessed. After that, we have the trials, clinical trials in humans. So we have phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, uh, which have the goal of uh, assessing the efficacy and safety and also the doses of the vaccine. So after this has been uh, done, the next stage will be the uh, post uh, licensing uh, or marketing surveillance. So many of you will be wondering, how could um, companies like Pfizer, Moderna, and Sinovac come up with a COVID vaccine within a year. Because if you look at the previous uh, chart, uh, the uh, normal typical uh, vaccine development takes around between five to 10 years. So you may be wondering, did they take any shortcut? Well, uh, not really. So the answers are because, uh, first of all, there have been significant investments by the vaccine manufacturers over the years. And uh, one of the vaccine platform, the mRNA vaccine platform, was already in development for years, although it was initially for other purposes like uh, cancer therapeutics and uh, gene therapy. Uh, and secondly, because of the pandemic situation, many uh, global partnerships were forged by international organizations and academic institutions. And also because of the pandemic situation, uh, it was relatively easy to recruit people for the randomized uh, controlled trials uh, more rapidly than uh, if it's not in a pandemic situation. And also one other uh, uh, significant factor is that they could perform the different trial phases concurrently. So to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, the US government actually uh, established what we call as the Operation Warp Speed Program. So this Operation Warp Speed was to spearhead the development and distribution of COVID vaccines, uh, mainly for use in the US. But at the global front, uh, we have uh, COVAX, which is a vaccines pillar convened by the three uh, organizations, CEPI, Gavi, and WHO, to speed up the, the search for an effective vaccine for all countries. And one of their main goals was to achieve equitable access to COVID ex, uh, vaccines for all countries. So the major funders of this global effort include uh, advanced uh, nations like Germany, UK, EU, Japan, Canada, Saudi, and Norway, and also the Bill Gates Foundation uh, through Gavi. Uh, um, US had initially uh, not uh, donated that much uh, under the previous president's uh, policy of uh, America first, but uh, President Biden had reversed that and pledged to donate $2 billion to this uh, global effort. Um, so this slide um, actually uh, compares the traditional versus the accelerated vaccine development timeline. So if you look at the traditional vaccine development timeline, um, each step 
is actually done in sequence, one after another. Preclinical followed by phase one, phase two, and then phase three trials. Um, to accelerate the COVID-19 vaccine development, the steps like preclinical phase one and phase two and also uh, infrastructure building are done in parallel or concurrently. And that's uh, followed by phase three, manufacturing, upscaling, and so on. So um, despite the accelerated uh, timeline, all the usual safety and efficacy monitoring mechanisms remain in place, such as adverse event surveillance, safety data monitoring, and long-term follow-up, which is still uh, ongoing as well. So if we look at the conventional recombinant vaccine research, um, there are many steps involved. First, scientists would have to identify the viral pathogen and its immunogens, and then uh, obtain the genetic code of the virus by DNA sequencing, and use bioinformatics computational tools to select the potential vaccine targets, and then uh, use PCR to amplify the gene that, codes, uh, that encodes the antigen, and then uh, amplify or, or highly express these uh, antigen proteins in um, bacterial yeast or mammalian host cells. Uh, this will be uh, then injected into uh, animal models like mice. And some, uh, in some cases, they also try, uh, try it out in chimpanzees. So then um, once uh, the, uh, the antigens show uh, high immunogenic potential then, and a good efficacy, then it will be tested in humans. Uh, in some of the uh, old school um, uh, method uh, for producing inactivated or live virus uh, vaccines, they, uh, it's also a very tedious and long process and even involves growing the virus in eggs. So what about the science behind the mRNA vaccines that uh, are uh, that, that are touted as new technology. So actually it turns out it's not very new um, because uh, scientists have worked on mRNA-based therapeutics for cancer and HIV for, for decades. mRNA is attractive alternative to DNA-based therapeutics because there is no chance of the mRNA inserting into human genomes and causing unwanted mutations. Furthermore, mRNAs are easy and rapid to tweak. So we can modify the mRNA sequence very rapidly uh, to suit um, different targets as what uh, Dr. Chris mentioned just now. If there are new variants or new strains of the virus, it can easily be uh, manufactured in large scale. So, but however, um, researchers initially face some hurdles for mRNA therapeutics and vaccines. And first of all, the mRNA is very unstable because it's single-stranded and because of its structure, uh, which uh, is different from DNA. So it is prone to degradation. And besides that, um, our body actually uh, recognized the synthetic mRNA as something foreign. And so it, uh, our body will actually mount some innate immune response uh, and uh, it was found that uh, it was the uracil nucleosides in the messenger RNAs that uh, caused this high innate immunogenicity. So they had, to, they had to find a way to overcome this problem. Uh, the other problem was the inefficient in vivo delivery. So this was uh, largely overcome by uh, encapsulating the messenger RNA in lipid nanoparticles to deliver into the uh, body. So uh, a scientist that has made remarkable contribution in the mRNA vaccine platform is actually Kathleen Kariko, a Hungarian biochemist who migrated to the US. So she has worked on mRNA um, uh, therapeutics and vaccines for at least 30 to 40 years. So persistence actually pays. 
So she managed to solve the problem of the mRNA-induced hyperimmune response by modifying the uh, building blocks of the mRNA. So mRNA is made up of four molecular building blocks, A, C, G, and U, called nucleosides. For the synthetic form of mRNA, the U nucleoside is like a misaligned wheel on a car, and it was throwing everything off by signaling the so Carico and uh, Weissman is immunologists together at the University of Pennsylvania. What they did was they simply swapped the universal and modified version, creating a hybrid mRNA that slipped its way into cells without alerting the cells to cancer. So in this diagram on the left side here, you see the unmodified unmodified DNA with the normal gene. Sorry, we can't hear you, uh, uh, Prof. Chong. I think something went wrong. This sounds a sound bit scratchy. Um, is everybody fine? Hello? 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 Yeah, sorry, we can't hear you clearly, actually. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, uh, okay. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. Yes, okay, we can hello? hear you. Hello, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Hello? 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 Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Ah, okay, all right, thank you. Yes, uh, please go ahead, but uh, uh, maybe let's right. try to wrap it up soon. Yes, okay, sure. Uh, let me do the, okay. So with the modified uh, uracil, um, it actually uh, bypasses the uh, innate immune system. Uh, sorry, the, the over uh, stimulation of the innate immune system. So I will skip this slide as uh, it's been mentioned by Dr. Musa. So I will just uh, now uh, just uh, go on to share with you some interesting current research projects uh, by different researchers in the world. So Dr. David Baker of University of Washington uh, designed some synthetic mini proteins that could bind tightly to the spike proteins of the virus. So three of these mini proteins could actually neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 and all protected the lab-grown human cells from infection. So it's a, a promising uh, finding. So uh, some of you might be wondering what is this colorful, uh, interesting picture here. So these are actually marine diatoms or microscopic algae uh, that some of them could withstand extreme temperatures in the Arctic and Antarctic Ocean. So these marine diatoms uh, were the inspiration of uh, Dr. Asil Sapeva of the University of Bath in UK uh, to solve the problem of cold chain. So as we all know, uh, some of these vaccines like the Pfizer vaccine needs to be transported in minus 80 degrees uh, freezer because of its uh, sensitivity to temperature. So um, using sand, Okay, basically uh, silicon dioxide or sand as the material, uh, Dr. Asil uh, managed to um, uh, grow this uh, sand silicon dioxide particles around the, uh, the protein uh, uh, vaccine antigens and to uh, maintain their structural integrity. So then it could be stored and, and uh, transported in room temperature. So I must say that she has uh, uh, done the proof of concept with the tetanus toxoid vaccine, but uh, not yet on the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, in the future, hopefully we may uh, be able to avoid painful injections uh, for our vaccination for COVID uh, because uh, a researcher from Finland, Professor uh, Seppo, had uh, designed a nasal spray vaccine against COVID. 
So our what about Malaysia, uh, Malaysian scientists? We are not short of uh, uh, brilliant uh, scientists with the expertise to produce our own vaccine, uh, hopefully in the near future. So um, one such person is Prof. Datin Dr. Khadija Yusof from UPM uh, with her co-researchers from the Veterinary Research Institute Malaysia, as well as University of Oxford and Malaysian Genome Institute. So uh, Prof. Uh, Datin Khadija, uh, in her project, she uses a chicken virus known as Newcastle disease virus to express the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the other person is Prof. Dr. Sazali Abu Bakar from UN and his team. So they have a pilot project to develop a modular mucosal uh, vaccine platform using the They vaccine. can't hear you. You can speak a bit louder, but we need to uh, wrap up. Very Hello? Soon. Yeah, can Hello? you speak a bit louder? Uh, is it audible now? Hello? Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, he has, uh, he and his team has uh, uh, a modular mucosal vaccine platform using grass bacteria against the coronavirus. Grass is generally recognized as safe bacteria. So uh, lastly, what are the potential future research uh, areas that uh, we all could uh, get involved in? So one very important uh, project that we should all try, uh, the uh, clinicians and uh, scientists should do is to have a genome surveillance of the SARS-CoV-2 to look out for any potential variants. And then prospecting for new immunogenic fragments of the SARS-CoV-2 through bioinformatics and animal studies. Basic research to explore the different routes of administering the vaccine through, for example, skin patch, microneedles, and intranasal spray. Studying the antibody titers and duration of persistence after vaccination and then exploratory research to solve the cold chain problem for wider vaccine distribution, especially to the rural areas. So with that, I thank you for your kind uh, attention uh, and hope that you have benefited from my presentation. Uh, back to Prof. Allen, please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Chong. Um, are there any questions, uh, any more questions for Prof. Chong? I think my number has been answered, I think, already. Um, um, I see uh, those who have typed in um, and that uh, I guess one uh, comment I'll say is that uh, while there are many new uh, vaccines being developed in the future as well for new using new technologies, um, the, you know, uh, it is important now for the, because it will take time for those to appear, right? So the, um, We'll still need to continue to use whatever it is, but uh, there's still work trying to further improve this. Yeah. Um, so let me see whether there are any other questions. Is the um, the Sinovac uses mRNA? Actually, Sinovac uses the you know is um it is the uh, uh, a life inactivated vaccine. Huh? Okay. Um. So there was um something there. Uh. Uh. Kevin, uh data on vaccine status in pregnant women. Um, there was some question about pregnant women in there. I think that one maybe if Prof. Musa could uh, uh, mention later or, or just uh, type in that I, I believe that uh, waiting for more data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, I think, for uh, all the three speakers uh, for, for your talks. I think we are coming towards the end of the uh, the the webinar. Yeah, perhaps I want to ask y'all: Are there any? Um, okay, basically in summary, yeah, the uh, the vaccine is generally safe, effective. Importantly, and also importantly, that uh, remember that ill health, which affects the general population, may coincidentally uh, happen to those who receive the vaccine. But it doesn't mean that the vaccine caused that problem. Yeah? Um, the um, and we need to ask always that, you know, whether that ill health was actually significantly different, increased in those compared, uh, in those who received the vaccine compared to those who have, um, who are experienced, who are, whether it's the incidence is higher than the general population or not, then only it could be due to the vaccine. Otherwise, it's just coincidence, okay? Um, and those who have severe disease, which uh, may require hospitalization, other than, you know, those may be cautious for, 
about the uh, getting the vaccine. But remember that you know if you need uh, person advice, please um, consult your own doctor. Lah. Okay. Um, and if you have other underlying conditions and things, remember that infection itself is the one which causes severe disease and death. And so they are prioritized. Huh? Um, and we hope that these general principles uh, would have helped you to understand and be useful for you to understand this vaccine. And as more research is coming on, right, more, more information will be known of the uh, disease and the efficacy. Yeah. Um, and importantly, because new variants are being reported, um, uh, while it's heartening to know that you know uh, the existing vaccines could still prevent severe disease and death in most of these, uh, but we still are worried about you know the possibility of even newer ones coming up. So important to keep this um, uh, a pandemic under control. Okay? So I wonder whether the panelists, anybody who has uh, any last take home messages for the people uh, you want to say? Yeah, beginning with, um, yeah, maybe Prof, Pe uh, Prof Chong who was the last speaker here. Maybe anything you want to tell, uh, last, anything you want to mention? Um, not really Prof Ellen. Mm -hmm. Just that okay. uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, the uh, uh, development of vaccine is a concerted effort and it uh, involves a lot of uh, shall I say, blood and sweat of mm -hmm. uh, the basic researchers as well, working behind the scenes. Yes, thank come you. Up with the and, um, and Prof, um, uh, Dr. Christopher Lee, anything, any well, take home messages for the people? Just, uh, uh, I think for all of us to do our part now, the, we leave it to the government to try to get the vaccines in as fast as they can. But I think we have to deal with the vaccine uh, hesitancy, especially those uh, people within our orbit. Do, let's do our part whether in social media or whether your personal connections, let's get the people you care for, get ready for vaccination and make sure they register and make sure they get go to the vaccine, get to get go to get vaccinated as soon as it's available to them. That's the best we can do for the people we care for the most. Thanks. And uh, Dr. Musa, um, any last words? Uh, yeah. Wisdom think, for the people. Uh, we are speaking to 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 uh, to a large bulk of uh, potential doctors, yeah, uh, healthcare professionals. I think it's very important that you guys spread the word, you know, because um, the public, your parents, your grandparents trust you, you know. We are a profession that is still uh, highly valued, you know. Uh, the trust deficit is like zero, you know. We are like teachers, you know. We honour our teachers, we honour our doctors. So you guys... Uh, when you say, mom, dad, take the vaccine, they will believe you, they trust you. Such is the honorable, honorable status of our, the nobility of our occupation. And I hope you will spread the word, yeah? Because if you have doctors out in social media saying that, you know, uh, uh, very lousy things about vaccine, it is very, very damaging. So I hope all the medical students in, 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 in Taylor's, you know, you go around and spread the good news of vaccines. It is our only salvation to exit from the, from the, uh, from this pandemic. Thanks a lot, uh, Taylor's, for having me to be part of your 10th anniversary. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for those, for, for the panelists, uh, for answering all the questions. Um, some uh, live, answered live, some on ty typed as well, the answer, question answer. Sorry, some could not be answered. Yeah. Um, so uh, gives me a, a great pleasure to actually uh, say thank you to everybody who has actually uh, uh, contributed and make this a success. I would like to um, uh, remind you that you know the um, the this uh, phase of uh, vaccine um, registration has begun, and that uh, those who have not registered, please do and. Uh, and the, the, you know, if you need any uh, special um, advice, please go and see your doctor. Okay. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much for uh, Taylor's uh, University for, um, for having us for this uh, webinar. I'd like to hand it over to the MC again. Yeah. Thank you for your kind words and closing remarks, Prof. Allen, as well as for being today's uh, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, we would like now to draw your attention towards the screen uh, for a post presentation poll. Uh, kindly answer the poll questions seen on your screen to answer, uh, and we will proceed after the thirty second mark.
Thank you for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come towards the end of our webinar. Before you leave, let me allow me to make some announcements. To all medical doctors who wish to collect their CPD points, the QR code is currently being displayed on the screen right now. Uh, so kindly take your phones and open your uh, MMA app and scan the QR code. We will leave it for about um, a minute. And in the meantime, uh, to all frontliners, on behalf of all Malaysians, we thank you for your efforts in the fight against COVID-19. Last but not least, if you enjoyed today's webinar, then we are proud to announce our upcoming webinar, again, by the School of Medicine, Taylor's University, this time on cancer care through COVID-19 and beyond, in conjunction with Cancer Awareness Day. I would also like to take this time to thank and acknowledge our VIPs and speaker for today, uh, Prof. Thomas, Prof. Bruce Lee, Prof. Allen, Prof. Musa, Prof. Christopher, and Prof. Chong. Thank you so much. Next, also acknowledging our organizing committee, Associate Professor Dr. Wong Eng Hua, Dr. Lim Su Yin, Dr. Sapna Shidar Patil, Dr. Priya Madhavan, Dr. To Gaiteng, and Dr. Wong Yin Hao. Not forgetting our Taylor's University Medical Society volunteers, Ms. Yvonne Peng, Mr. Neshwan Nasim, Mr. Alentino Raven, and myself, Mr. Robert So Jr. Last but not least, we would also like to acknowledge all our participants today. We could not have made this webinar possible without each and every one of you. Sincerely from the organizing committee, we thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Final words from Taylor's University. Stay safe, stay positive, and we wish you all the best. Hope to see you again soon.